Oh, you, oh, okay. Oh, I'll tell you later then. <laughs> All righty, good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, I saw a lot of teens walk in this building, and there were some I did not recognize that were in the back, a few there. Harmony, was that a couple new ones? Yeah. Are they friends of um, the, um, of what? Of the merits. Okay, great. Yeah, well, I saw some teens back there, and uh, that's always exciting to have uh, young people in the auditorium. So I have some good news to tell you. Would you like to know the good news? Yeah. Yes. Well, I got a text today that our oldest grandson, which will be eight in when? October 2nd. I know that. Uh, told me that a lot of people have been sowing in his life, talking to him about the gospel, and uh, he goes to a school where they have a chapel, and he likes his uh, teacher, and he'll tell me things that he's learning about different kings or different this and that. It's kind of exciting to listen to them talk about it as it being so new, and you can't tell them that you already know that. You just have to wait till they get it all out, because you want to say, oh no, oh yeah, you know. But anyways, uh, he trusted the Lord as his Savior. And um, in fact, uh, his father was talking to him and, and, and he said that uh, he had heard the gospel, of course, many different times. Nancy and I have shared it with him and others have shared it with him. And he said he actually, about a week ago, did he say, he was in bed, couldn't sleep. And he said right there on his bed, he said what he prayed. He said, I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sin and uh, trust him as my savior. And he didn't tell anybody. <laughs> so, but, but now he's told everybody. So... That's exciting. Exciting news. Yeah, that's, that's a great comment. That's good. That is good. That's very good. That's very good. Okay, one down, three to go. <laughs> yeah, three that we know of. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, I uh, had a good trip. I got to go down and train a church that's going to have neighborhood Bible time in Miami Beach. And then I was able to go across the state to the other side and was at a rally last night and a lot of teenagers and uh, heartbreaking things that I saw there, picking up the kids on the bus, just um, homes that I don't even know how they were standing. And yet these kids, they came running out, they were so excited a couple of ribbons on their chest, you know, they were about time ribbons. They had their little handbooks. They were running and they didn't care where they lived. They just excited to get on the bus and of course came in, uh, came in for the rally. It was in a little town called Zol Zoloff Springs, Wachula, just north of uh, Zoloff Springs. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's about an hour east, I mean, hour, yeah, east of, um, of Sarasota, if you know where Sarasota is. And so I uh, had a great time there with the young men last night as well. And uh, I said to them after the rally, the two young men that are serving there, I said, do you want to go get something to eat? They didn't hesitate. They were in my car. They were in my car waiting right away. So we found the only place open in Wachula. <laughs> and we stayed there until it closed at midnight. That was the only place open. Sonics. You ever hear of Sonics? Sonic. Um, yeah, so we ate there. Mm. Well, there's a lot of them in Florida. Alrighty, well, let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, jump into our study in the book of Ephesians, and uh, maybe some of our teenagers and some of our children are making decisions too. Maybe some for salvation, maybe some for godly living, maybe some are going to make a decision tonight that will uh, change their life. We have two up at camp. I guess they're having a great time from what I heard. Yeah, they seem to be having a, a great time, and... Uh, we're so glad that they were able to go. I said, do you think they, when they come back, they'll want to maybe say something up here on a testimony? And Tim said, he, I, that's, I, I said he will. I said, I don't know about Nick. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for Christ. Thank you for uh, the hope of salvation. And salvation's a hope, but it's a seen hope. It's a confident hope. It's, well, it's not a seen hope yet, but it's a confident hope. It's a hope that we know that one day, no matter what transpires in this life, that we will see you. And how exciting that will be. We'll be in our glorified bodies one day. And all this will be behind us. But until then, we're to serve, we're to love, 
We're to reach out to others. We're to care for one another. We're to take care of one another. We're to help each other. And so, Lord, help us to do that by your grace, because that's not easy to do. But we want to do it. So encourage us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So we are looking at the different parts of the uh, armor. And um, it's kind of confusing sometimes when you're studying it because they, they, all the commentaries I'm reading, you know, to help me through understand it a little bit better, is they spend so much time on comparing the Roman armament to the, to the, to the armor. Well, you can get lost in that, and you're just thinking that you're putting on like a breastplate, but it's not the breastplate, it, it is the spiritual aspect of what the breastplate represents, and so we got to be careful that we don't get caught up more with the uniform looks like, because really, you don't put on a uniform, you realize that. We're putting on the spiritual aspect of these different pieces of armor because they help us to overcome and defeat the wilds of the devil. So don't think that, you know, I'm putting on a breastplate. Uh, it's just the analogy that Paul chose to use so that those uh, ones that lived there in Ephesus could understand uh, an analogy, so to say. But we have to remember that we're not actually wearing armor. We are applying biblical truth and principles to our life to be able to fight against the wiles of the devil. We don't actually carry a sword. We carry the scriptures. So the scriptures are hidden in our mind. They're, 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 they're hidden in our heart. And, and that's what we use, the rhema and, and the logos of the, world, of the world to fight against the wilds of the devil. And we'll learn that again tonight as we looked at truth, the belt of truth, and now we'll look at the breastplate of righteousness. So our, our verse is Ephesians 6.14, stand, military term, Remember that as we go over this verse again. Stand therefore, in other words, the piece of land that God has given you, the, the, the area that you live in, the area you work in, the area that you spend probably most of your time in. The, for me, it's the Elgin and Hampshire area that we spend our time in. We're to stand therefore. And what are we supposed to do? Having your loins, which we learned last week, girded about with truth, and then second, which we didn't cover, and having on the what? The breastplate of righteousness. So let's try to take a look at what that means to us as believers today. So what is the breastplate of righteousness? Well, when the Bible uses the term righteousness, it has different meanings. So when you go through the Bible and you look at the word righteousness, you're going to have to know what righteousness it's talking about. Can you think of an English word that would have more than one meaning? You'd have to find out the context of what is in there so that we know. Uh, what's that? Trunk. trunk? Right. A trunk or a trunk. Like a tree trunk or a... An elephant, an elephant trunk. Or a trunk you put things in. Or a trunk you put things in. So you have to kind of look at the context. And it's the same thing with words like judgment, words like righteousness. There, there, there are some different meanings depending on uh, the context of what it's talking about. And so, same thing with the word righteousness. So, what's he talking about? Well, we don't, want to, we don't want to apply the wrong righteousness. We want to apply the right righteousness that Jesus is, or our Paul is talking about in the scriptures. So, when the Bible uses the term righteousness, it has different meanings. So, righteousness used in the context of Christ is this type of righteousness. It's the righteousness when used is the justifying righteousness of one who is perfect. So our righteousness, which we can have, we can have righteous living, we can do right, but we can't have the righteousness that's talking about when it's talking about Christ, because Christ's righteousness is what? Perfect. It is without blemish. So when it's talking about justification by faith, the imputed righteousness of Christ, it uses a different Greek word. It uses the root word of the Greek, and justified righteous or one who's perfect, the Greek, the Greek root word in this case is uh, dekaios. De the meaning is, by implication, innocent, holy, absolute, just, meet, and right. We don't have that type of righteousness. 
we don't have perfect righteousness. We are all fallen. We all have a sin nature. Not only do we have a sin nature because of the fall of Adam, and we're born through the seed of, uh, of, 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 of Adam, is that also we, um, we choose to sin. So, so we don't have that type of righteousness. This righteousness is used when we're talking about Christ righteousness. So Romans 3.22 says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So the righteousness of God is a perfect righteousness that is imputed into our life so that when God sees us, he doesn't see our unrighteousness. He sees Christ's righteousness. That's how we're going to heaven, because we're not being judged by our good deeds or our works, but by the imputed. And that was just a fancy word for what is placed inside of us. We do not have inside of us to become righteous perfect righteousness we need christ righteousness and that's what it's talking about here romans 5 17 for by one man's offense death reigned by one much more than which the which received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one jesus christ so we reign or we live we have everlasting life because when we depended on christ he gave us his righteousness which is perfect. You don't want my righteousness. I don't want your righteousness because you know what? It's not going to get me anywhere. You might be more righteous than me in an area or I might be more righteous than you in an area that we're living, but the bottom line is we all have problems. None of us are perfect. And so our righteousness will not save us. We need the imputed righteousness of Christ. Romans 5.21 says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so my grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're righteous because of His righteousness. Our robes for what? For His robes. Our unrighteousness for what? His righteousness. Romans 8.10 And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. The triune God. And then 1 Corinthians 1.30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto, unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Because of Christ, we can be righteous. Righteous. So the breastplate is not talking about that type of righteousness. It is talking about a different type of righteousness. Now, we can't even obtain the right time of character without first being saved. So in one sense, yes, it, it means that we have to be born again to even put on the breastplate of righteousness, but we're going to see as we look at this that the breastplate of righteousness is only as good as our character is. And I'll show you what that means in a moment, so stay with me here. So second is this, another term, righteousness, used in the context of a believer. This righteousness, when used, speaks of the change of our character to righteousness from unrighteousness. So here's what's happening. We're saved by what? The imputed righteousness of Christ, correct? Okay, but then God begins to change us because uh, the righteousness of justification is our spirit. It's attached to Christ. So it is perfect. But then our soul is what? Being saved. When we get saved, we don't arrive right away, do we? Do we still have problems? Does anybody here have any struggles at all with sin? Good, three of us. So we have those struggles with sin. So, so, so the righteousness, of the, of the believer, the righteousness when it speaks of is God now is changing our character. So our soul is being saved. We're being changed, what we would call, f through sanctification unto holiness. We might say it this way, more Christ-like. So righteousness, as we grow and become more Christ-like, we, we grow in our righteousness. He, he changes us to be righteous, to, to have character, to do what's right. Here's some examples of that. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all, 
with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So as we look into this book, this mirror right here, it begins to show us to renew our mind so that we will do righteous acts because we are righteous because of the imputed righteousness. But now God wants to change our, 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 our as our soul is growing unto Christ's likeness that we would also then be the real deal in our character. He says in the book of Ephesians, he says, if you've lied, don't lie anymore. And if you steal, don't steal anymore. If you, if you went up and worshiped to, to the idols, don't do that anymore. Those are righteousness that we can have because of the imputed righteousness of Christ. Then our soul, our mind, will, and intellect, he's trying to change to do righteous acts because we are saved. Not be, Our acts don't make us saved, but because we are. So in Romans 13, 14, it says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So now that we're saved, we don't want anything to do with the world anymore. We want to lay that aside and we want to live in the newness of life, a righteous life. A righteous life. And then Colossians 3.10 says, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created us. So God is changing us from glory to glory to glory to glory. Let me ask you this question to help kind of bring it into your mind. Are you different than you were the first year you got saved? Has there been any changes in your life? Hopefully that's been true, that you keep growing and growing in progressive sanctification, in holiness, in righteousness, in your character, so that you can do right. Now, the imputed righteousness is a one-time act. It's called justification. It's where God declares that you are justified. Just like if in a courtroom, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, judge pounds the gavel and says, you are innocent. That is that justification. That's that righteousness from Christ. But then... He wants to reform us through the Holy Spirit to be righteous in our will, our mind, and our intellect. So the breastplate or the coat of mail is what we want to look at tonight. What does that mean? How do you put that on? And how is that practically used in our life to fight against the wiles of the devil or the battle that we face every day? Do you sense the battle every day? Do you? Yes? How do you sense it sometimes? I sensed it in picking up those kids. There was a real battle for the souls of that community. I sensed a real war going on there. I sense it when I meet um, us. Um, sometimes I, I, I sense it when, when, um, my, when I want to do right, there's something fighting against that, you know, to do my own will. Do you, do you sense that battle? How do you sense it? Do you see it anywhere that you are where you sense that constant battle? Well, sometimes when I get up in the morning, I read my Bible faithfully every morning. And I'm not saying that to be arrogant or anything. But sometimes the devil will get in and say, hey, you have this to do and you have that to do. And, mm. you know, you can't let that bother you. Sure. Sure, there's a pull to stay busy with other things, maybe. Anybody else have anything that they can think of that maybe they kind of maybe sense or feel that, that war? There's, that's huge. Right. No, so you see that constant battle there for the affections of our mind. So the breastplate would be the armor that covers the body from the neck to the thighs. So from here to here, the Roman soldiers would wear this metal type of um, breastplate, or um, they call it a coat of mail as well. And this armor generally consists of two parts, one covering the front 
and the other covering the back. That's not always the case, but in most cases, that's what it is. Um, it, it's made up of rings or forms of scales or plates, and they were fastened together and would be flexible to protect the body from what? The sword, a spear, or maybe an arrow, and it, it protects what part it's covering from here down into your legs, maybe, maybe about right here or so, almost looks like a little short skirt, it goes down to about that level there. What organs would you say are so vital that those need to be so protected because any type of shot there would probably kill you? What, what, what organs would those be that you think that they're protecting? The chest, okay. The kidneys, the heart, lungs. Those are all pretty vital places. And so that, that coat of mail or the, the, breastplate, the breastplate of, of um, that the soldiers would wear were very important because they don't fight like we do today. Some of our fighting is, you know, there's an F-14 that, or an F-18 probably now or whatever they are now, an F-18 that paints a building um, 35 miles away and then he shoots a missile and that missile goes inside the window and it blows up the whole thing. A lot of that is done long distance now and we don't have as much hand to hand, but back then, you know what they did? They did this. He, uh, Craig would line up there, I'd line up there and everybody get their men together and somebody would blow it, he'd start marching towards me and I'd start marching towards him and when we got close, whatever we had, hatchets, you name it, we'd be swinging it and it would be hand to hand combat. They would shoot the arrows and they would come in that way. And so the breastplate was very needful uh, for a, a soldier in that day and age. We would not wear those today. We have something like that. What do our police officers wear? Yeah, a bulletproof vest, because that's probably what they mostly face would be that. And that protects their vital organs as well. Um, uh, flexible, so it protect the, the body. It refers to in the scriptures as a coat of mail or a breastplate. In 1 Samuel 17, 5, it says, And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, M-A-I-L, and, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. Now, how many of you measure things at home by shekels? No. So it's 5,000 shekels, a lot. I don't, what is that? But the scriptures tell us that Goliath, which was a very tall man, a very big man, an unusual size man, a coat of mail weighed 5,000 shekels of brass or nearly 160 pounds in weight. Now for us, we wouldn't even be able to get him fight. Put 160 pounds on us, but for the average soldier, it was probably about half of that. Might have weighed maybe 70 pounds or maybe a little bit more, 75 pounds, 70 pounds, but it was so important and so vital for the battle. So that kind of explains why uh, uh, the Apostle Paul chose to use that as a, 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 an analogy because we're trying to protect us as well. So let's look at growing righteousness. The breastplate defends the vital parts of the body and the thought here from the Apostle Paul is talking about the integrity of life and righteousness of character, which is necessary to defend us against the assault of Satan. Just as the coat of mail was to preserve the heart from the arrows of an enemy, our righteousness or our character allows us to make the right decision so that we do not fall towards the wilds of the devil because the devil is always assaulting us to do things that are outside of God's will. But if we have the character of God, if we're growing in areas of character, then we can say no to sin. If a man is born again, but he has no integrity, what is going to happen when he's in temptation about his integrity or what to do? He, he, will, he will fall into that sin. And so we want to, uh, our coat of righteousness or our breastplate of righteousness is really our character. So is character important to the Lord? If you take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Timothy, 
chapter number 3. Now, some people will argue how many of character issues are, 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 are placed in there, but you figure there's probably about 14, maybe 15 areas of character. And even though it's talking about the bishop or the pastor, it is also really talking about all of us should have this type of character. But it says in chapter number 3 of 1 Timothy, it says, this is a true saying, if a man desireth the office of the bishop, he desireth what? A good work. So it's a work. So a bishop then must be what? Blameless. And, and now we're going to go through all these. We're going to look at a couple of these. But when he gets down to the bottom, he's, he's, he says here, Moreover, he must have good report of them, them that are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So these characters set the walls high so that we do not fall into condemnation or into the wilds of the devil or the snare of the devil. What is a, what is a snare as a hunting term? Yeah. A trap. A trap. And it's, it's, it's a snare because you don't obviously see it. It's maybe buried, or but it's a trap that we can walk into. And so Satan is always setting snares but a man of character will see them. A woman of character will see the snare ahead of time because they are walking in that character that allows them to see things that the ordinary eye would not see. Let's go over some of these. So the Bible says a bishop then must be blameless. So one thing that we want to have in our character is that we be blameless, that we would not have weaknesses that everyone can see, that it's so obvious. Um, I don't know if you watch much of the NFL football, but if you play NFL football and you are a defensive, um, if you are rather an offensive uh, or defensive um, on the line, they tuck their shirts in really tight so that nobody can grab onto them. There's nothing, they, there's no handles, there's nothing to grow on, grab onto. And that's what it's saying here is that we would not have vices or handles of sin that are so obvious because that's where Satan's going to attack. So we're to be blameless. Work on your character in that area. Find out areas where you're just weakened, that, that, that you don't have victory over, and, and ask God to give you victory in those areas. Because if not, that's where Satan attacks. He attacks where we're weak, where the handles are obvious. Um, to be seen. And it says, um, a husband of one wife, um, vigilant, we should be vigilant, sober, of good behavior, uh, given to hospitality, not greedy, not given to wine, not a striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetousness. So it, it, it's saying that if we're going to have good character, we got to stay away from all these vices that would cause us to fall into sin so that we can be blameless and that we can not fall into the snare of the devil. And it says the same thing for a deacon. It says the same thing, talks about a deacon's wife as well. So, so what we want to do is we want to work on the areas of our character. Now we're going to look at some other areas here. So the breastplate defends the vital part of the body. And the thought here is the Apostle Paul saying so that, that we will not be caught by the arrows of the enemy. As always, it is true that no one can successfully meet the power of temptation unless they are righteous. Just as a soldier could not defend himself against a foe without such a coat of mail, a lack of integrity will leave a person exposed to the assault of the enemy. If we have no integrity, if, 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 if we're willing to fall into any type of sin that we see, or any vice that we're around, well, then we're not going to be able to stand. And, and, and so the, the, the righteousness for us, the, 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 the breastplate of righteousness, is really working on your character. When's the last time you purposely worked on your character? That you would have integrity in the way that you work, integrity in the way that you live. So... The king of Israel was smitten by an arrow sent from a bow. I think, um, I was thinking about this. Um, I think, Craig, you mentioned this one. Yeah. You said this one always gets you. <laughs> and uh, now that you said that, I'm picturing him, you know, just kind of launching it. But that's what Satan does. 
He just launches all these arrows. So if you have integrity in that area and an arrow is coming for you to cheat on your wife, cheat on your husband, cheat at work, or not do things you're not supposed to do, if you're a man of or woman of integrity, then when that arrow comes, you, it, 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 will, it, it, it will bounce off of you. It will have nowhere to get in. But if you're lacking in that area, if you're not growing in your integrity or in your truthfulness or whatever it might be, then that arrow, you'll walk right into the arrow. And, and just like when that arrow was shot by uh, that man, by, by just, just, he just sent the arrows. He said, I got one arrow left, I'm going to let it go. See where it lands. And so he lets the arrow down, and what does it do? It, it hits the king between the joint and the harness. There's only a little place right there. It's, it's about this wide. And it fell in there. And we know that king had no integrity. That king that was killed with that arrow, he did not have integrity at all. In fact, he was against God. And because of that, he was exposed because he was not living a righteous life. So lack of character explodes, exposes us to the wilds of the devil. The wilds of the devil. So when there's a defect of character, such as integrity, holiness, purity, sincerity, piety, then, 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 then the devil has a way in. And so when we're, when we're working on our character, it makes our breastplate that covers our life and protects us very strong so that when those temptations come, they don't even phase us. One man can walk right down the road and, and he doesn't even see what another person sees because he's constant, the other guy, his eyes are not focused on the cross and so he's looking and when he looks, he is tempted and when he's tempted, sometimes he's drawn away then by his lust. And so when we work on our character, then we're able to stay away from everything that Satan throws out there. It's incredible. It's incredible everything that is out there, just one keystroke away on the computer. All the drugs, all the um, uh, immorality, just, just uh, uh, stealing or justifying certain ways of life. And, and God says, wait a minute, if you have character and you know the scriptures, then when you see that, you'll say, no, 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 and you'll go the other way. You'll walk the other way. You'll turn immediately away. And that's what it means by the breastplate of righteousness. You can be born again and have imputed righteousness, but never work, allow the Holy Spirit to work on your growing in righteousness so that you'll have that problem everywhere you go. Some Christians are just always in trouble. They're just always in some type of vice that God has freed them from because they are not allowing the Spirit to give them the strength in that character to say no to that sin, that they no longer do that. There's that song that says, the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Because they're growing in that area of character. They're strengthening it. So work on your character. Find out when you're reading the scriptures areas where God says that we ought to be holy, good, loving, forgiving. If we don't work on those areas and ask God to give us grace to manifest those type of things in our life, then what's going to happen is when that arrow is coming towards us, there'll be a propensity to enter into that sin. So really we form our breastplate of righteousness because we are righteous. So if you're not born again and you don't have the imputed righteousness of Christ, then you can't even have the breastplate of righteousness. But now that, now that we're saved, we put on the breastplate of righteousness by allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us to get rid of some of those handles that we have in our life. Bad attitudes, those type of things. So we don't want any def defect in our character in those areas. This will be a place where, where it will become a point of attack by the foe. So when an army is thinking about attacking, like the United States, let's say they decide that we're going to war or there's a, there's a necessary need, and the generals get together, what do they look for in the enemy? 
a weakness. They look for a weakness. They find out. They already know probably most of the countries, if they have to go to war, they probably already thought through how they would attack a certain country. And the same way as they probably look at America and they have to look at where, you know, like in America, they might say it might be better not to attack America with guns and missiles. We maybe ought to just wait because they're going to destroy themselves because we have lack of integrity. And so they can just see us imploding from within. We might not have to have an enemy from without. But certainly that has always been the case, is to find where the weakness is. Back in Bible times, in the Old Testament, they would look for the conduits. They would look for where the water would get into where the, the place was, because water was difficult in Israel, so they'd have to run it from somewhere, and they would try to find the conduits, and guess what they would do? They would attack the conduits. Why? It stopped the flow of water. And so, same thing, Satan works the same way. He casts the arrows... And those that are believers are righteous because of the imputed righteousness of Christ. But sometimes we don't allow God to get rid of those areas of our life that are weaknesses, bitterness, anger, lying, stealing, cheating, pride, anger, jealous, envy. Those things we allow to reign in our life. And so when all those arrows are coming... Those ones that, because Satan doesn't know exactly which one. He's, he doesn't know all things. But he just, he, just, he just sends, just like this man did, just by a venture, he just lets it go. And, and you know what? It sidelines a lot of Christians. They are righteous by the imputed righteousness of Christ, but because they're not allowing God to change those wicked areas of their life. I was with a gentleman this week, and he told me very plainly, that that's just the way he is, that part of his life can never change. Well, you know what? He's open then to the attacks of Satan. He has a propensity. He has handles in that area. And so when he runs into those arrows of temptation, he's wide open. He hasn't closed up the breastplate. He's left a little bit of area there uh, that is going to hurt his vital organs might ruin his life, might ruin his family, might ruin the community. It might sideline him as well. Sincere, so this will be a place that will become a point of attack by the foe. So David was tempted to commit the enormous crimes that stained his memory. So David evidently now, we don't, the Bible doesn't say why David had that weakness, but we could guess. We could say that maybe, you know, God never said that you should have many wives. It could have been that he had so many concubines and he had so many women that he had a propensity then because he was outside of God's will. So he had a propensity that when he saw something, he wanted it. And so maybe that, that was it, because he shouldn't have had all those wives. God never said you should have that. He chose to do that. And because of that, maybe that's why there was a weakness there. And then once that sin got in, what happened? There was more sin committed because of that. And so, so David left himself open because he was saved. There's no doubt about that. The Bible's very clear that he knew the Lord. And Peter denied the Lord. So Peter had a weakness there in, that, in his character. And because of that, it caused a lot of problems for Peter's life. A lot of doubt. A lot of hurt. So our character is important. Did you know that? Character is really important. How's your character? When nobody sees you, and nobody will ever know what you do, how's your character? No one's ever going to find out that you did it. No, I mean, the Lord, of course, sees it. But nobody's going to know. Because no one's there. You're all by yourself. And you engage in that type of behavior or whatever it is. No one's ever going to know it except for you. Let's say, you know, among your family or friends, they're never going to know it. So the test of the character is how we respond when nobody else will know. Do we still do what's right? There's a good test of your character. 
hey, you know, I could steal that piece of bubble gum. No one's really going to, I'm going to give you the ridiculous to show you the obvious. I could steal that little piece of bubble gum because no one's ever going to really know that I've taken it. And that's what it's talking about is that character needs to be tested. It needs to be strengthened because that's how we make our breastplate. So where are the holes in your breastplate? I bet you have some great strengths. I bet there are some lines that you would not cross. I bet there's some lines in right here you could stand up faithfully and say, you know what, I know I could cross that line, I guess, if I let my guard down and I, you know, but, 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 but basically I'm probably not. I mean, you, you've seen over the last 20 or 25 years of your life, that's just a line that you don't cross. That line's there and you just don't cross it. It's a very strong area of character. But where would you say are some holes in your breastplate? Some areas that we're not really paying the attention to that we should. So that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying that you have the imputed righteousness of Christ, so you're born again. No one can take that away from you. You are, but what about when you put your breastplate on? How many holes are in there? And so Satan can sideline us. How many Christians today are sidelined because of the wiles of the devil? Because it's, it's a battle every day. Did you know that? It's a battle every, every single, single day. You get up every day, it is a raging battle. And if we're not ready for the battle by having the right breastplate on, of course, we have his imputed righteousness, so that's right, that has to be first. But then that, that, that breastplate that we wear, we need to yield to the Lord in those areas. So practically speaking, what do we need to do? If we know those areas need to be protected and we know we need to be working on our character all the time, all the time, strengthening it. We need to be diligent. God calls us out of the world, but not out of work. So he calls us out of the world. He says, listen, don't participate in those worldly activities anymore. Don't, don't. He calls us out of the world. He always has always separated light from darkness. All the way from the very beginning in Genesis. And he's always separated his people unto himself. God always separates. He separates. He is separated from all sinfulness. We should be as well. And so be diligent. We're called out of this world, but not out of work. We're to be working on our character every day. Every day. We ought to be thinking about those areas that we are tempted to enter into. We should do it for conscience sake. We don't want to weaken our conscience. If we don't, see some, some Christians are born again, they definitely have the righteousness of God, the imputed righteousness, but their conscience has been seared or it has been tainted or it's been, it's been damaged, the soul has been damaged because of the amount of sin it is letting in, the soul is hurt. Because the way our flesh works is it works off of habits. So when we, when we allow a sin in all the time, we become addicted to that sin. And, and we don't want that to happen. So for conscience saints, if we don't have character, then we'll sear our conscience. 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse number 5 and 619. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and out of a good conscience. So when we are living out of love, we are living out of a pure heart, out of character, then we can have a good conscience and faith that's unfeigned. In other words, it is a real thing. From, from which some have swerved. Have you ever swerved before in your car? Swerve. Have swerved, having turned aside unto vain jangling, committed, um, uh, vain jangling, um, uh, committed to my trust. And then verse 19 says in 6, holding faith and a good conscience where some have been put away concerning the faith have made shipwrecked. So there's two different things going on here. Is, is The good conscience is we want our conscience not to be seared. We don't want our conscience to be pierced. We don't want to have any holes. Someone one time explained it this way when I was in the military. I was on an aircraft carrier and we called it the hard deck. That was the, where the planes would land. 
And so when they came down, man, they hit pretty hard. There's a lot of thrust, and I don't know what those aircrafts weigh, but they're, they're pretty powerful. And so the way that the, um, the deck was constructed, it's, it's very hard. And so when a plane bounces on it, it's okay. It, it repels it. It keeps from it. But if you break apart that hard deck, it's, it's not good for anything. It allows everything into it. And we don't want to allow our conscience to be seared. We don't want to allow our conscience to be broken up to allow in all the trash and garbage that's out there today. We want to keep our conscience uh, of pure faith, of holiness, of charity, not allowing anything into it at all. Because the Bible says, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, so those that aren't, their faith has been made shipwreck. There's a lot of people today that are born again. They're truly born again. They have the imputed righteousness of Christ, but they're living a life where you say, wow, I don't think they're saved. Because they've allowed so much garbage into their life that when all those arrows are, arrows are flying, they're just hitting them left and right. And they're just, they're just everything. They just angry, upset, this and that and this and that because they're not working on those areas of character. Their faith has been made shipwrecked or of none effect. So for conscience sakes, and be diligent, when spiritual success comes, some of the greatest times when Satan attacks is when uh, we've had good success in our life. In other words, we see God working in our life and we've made some spiritual decisions and things seem to be going well and things are moving forward. We have a tendency to let our guard down. We have a tendency to try to live off of that spiritual success of the past. Acknowledge God for success you see in your life and, and go to work every day on your character. When things are going well, we have a tendency to wander, wander from God. When things are okay, and so um, uh, there's a tendency to kind of just kind of move away from the Lord. Uh, here's one too. Learn to be content. Learn to be content helps in your character, the character of contentment. It's hard to be content, isn't it? There's always a reason not to be content. When you can carve, now this is, this is a quote that I read from William Gurnall. He's a Puritan from the 1600s. He said, when you can carve contentment out of God's providence, no matter what dish is set before you, that's contentment. And that's the kind of commitment. Because see, Satan knows that if he can get us discontented, he has a big hole in our breastplate of righteousness. You ever been discontented? Maybe you know some of the uh, characteristics of discontentment. For me, I get pacing. I get anxiety. <laughs> I just get discontented. You know, I just, I get discontented. I, I told Nancy that today. I said, Durr. today was a hard day for me. Um, I, I had a situation go on, um, and, and, and I, I was just getting discontented with the whole situation. And I couldn't seem to find that contentment in the Lord. And, and Satan wants that, that to happen because if I get that way, then I have a hole in my breastplate. And so w then I can start complaining to everybody about my discontentment. And then the next thing you know, it just, it just, it just bubbles out. So God says, so learn to be content. I love this quote. When you can carve contentment. What a powerful word. When you can carve contentment out of God's providence, no matter what dish is set before you. I had just set before me today. And I was not carving very well. <laughs> uh. Read it. Uh. Amen. I think that that, I think one of the greatest signs of discontentment is an ungrateful heart. Just not happy. Hey, if you have verses, please send them this way. I, I don't think I have, um, I don't have, think I have everything uh, perfectly together here, but, but uh, so whatever you're going through now, if you're walking in the spirit, then God has carved that out and he can give you contentment because if you don't, guess what happens? The breastplate has a hole in it. Your hard deck, your, your, your soul can be damaged and, 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 and there's a way in. Don't allow any way in. 
Nancy and I were digging out some plants that have been in our yard probably since the person that was there before us. So Nancy finally said to me, can you just dig those things out? They're 25 years old, they're half living, and just let's get rid of them and let's replant that whole area. So when we went out there, my wife started like just hitting the shovel a little bit, and she says, what is this? And we cleared off the mulch, and there was this big red brick. And then next to that was another big red brick. And my wife said, oh yeah. She goes, that's when we put all those bricks there because we were tired of the chipmunks living underneath our porch. What we did was we closed everything up and with these bricks, buried them in there because they would get in. And you know what? We haven't had chipmunks in years now. I, we see them next door, <laughs> and, but we don't see them there. Maybe you have a vent, like a, like a dryer vent, and you put a piece of what? Screening around it. Why? Because the birds love to go in there. Yeah. My wife and I told our neighbors, and said, hey, listen, we just want to let you know that there's a traffic cop up there uh, guiding the birds in and out of your vent. I mean, they were, weren't they, Nancy? They are flying in and out. Man, this was like a great condo. I think, I think that might have been a, um, what do you call those things, an Airbnb or something, because uh, they, these, these birds were sharing it or whatever, and they were flying right in, right out, and, and they said, yeah, we got to put a screen up around it. Well, that's what we're to do here. We have the imputed righteousness of Christ. We can't do any better than that. I mean, we are born again. Make no doubt about that. There's no way you can please the Lord anymore because you are completely pleasing to Him because of the imputed righteousness of Christ. But there's the life that we live in and God wants us to work on character, so putting on that breastplate so we would be content and that when spiritual success comes, we wouldn't say, yeah, look at me. Look what I did. Look what I'm doing. Or for our conscience sake, that it would not be, it would not be damaged or seared and we need to be diligent. And then also, we must prioritize. How many of you are prioritizers? Are you a prioritizer? How many else are a prioritizer? You are? Yeah, Nancy, I know Nancy is. Anybody else? Yeah, you are too? Yeah, so you get up in your day and you say, hey, listen, this has to get done. You know, this is a priority. If I get to this, I get to this. I use a number system, one, two, three. I look at my day and I say, this is a three. If I get to it, fine. But all my ones... I got to get to, because if I don't get to my ones, it's going to cause more trouble. Yeah, if I don't get to the two, that's okay. I'd like to get to it. Just like today, working on the plane, I was working on my twos and threes, you know, because your ones, you got to get done. You got to prioritize that. And then your threes become twos and your twos become one. And sometimes it's just overwhelming, but you need to prioritize. A believer does not let his vocation steal his time from communion with God. That has got to be your number one priority. You cannot allow your work or whatever it is, or, or, or your lifestyle, or your, 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 whatever it is, you can't allow that to take away your communion with God. That's the most important thing. It's not your ministry. It's, it's, it's not that, that's not what, it is your relationship with God. That has got to be a priority. Not to be saved, but because we are saved, we have that beauty of that communion with the Lord. Character frees the believer to make his way into the presence of God even through the pressing crowd of worldly encumbrance. This is the same gentleman again from William Grinnell, and, that, and, and that's a beautiful quote as well. So, so, so that communion just breaks through all the worldly encumbrances. And there's a lot of them, aren't they? Does anybody know what encumbrances are? What is an encumbrance? Or you encumber something, or what is it? Yeah, it gets in the way. It attaches to it. You, 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 you're encumbered by it. it. It adds to the weight. And we have to be careful because the character frees us up from the pressing crowd of worldly encumbrances that we face every day we face them every day what's the worst you know what time time everybody knows what time it is there's all kinds of time there's um there's there's a time to mourn there's a time to laugh there's a time to go to school there's there's time for all kinds of time to work like when i texted you the other day you said can't call you right now busy day and i said is that good and you said yes <laughs> So that's, that, was his, that was his thing. It was a time to work. He needs to work. 
and so on. So there's those good times too. What is the worst type of time? It starts with an I. Oh, good job. The two ladies. Idle time is the most dangerous time. It's the devil's workshop. And so we have to make sure that we don't allow us as born-again believers to just have hours and hours of idle time. When you are idle, you have to, your mind and your body wants to do something. You'll find something to do, and it's usually not a very positive thing. So schedule your day. Prioritize your day. Don't allow idle time to be... Now, it's, it's good. The Bible says it's good for us to be refreshed. I refreshed last night for an hour with those boys. You know, it was, it was just eating. There was, you know, we were just eating and laughing. That's all we were doing. But we want to be careful that we don't have hours upon hours upon hours every day. God built us for work. Did you know work was not ordained or given after the fall? It was given, go ahead, before the fall. God said, tend the garden. God always made humans to work. It is natural for us to work. It was not a condition of the fall. Now, the work became harder after the fall, thorns and thistles, and the ground was harder, and, and so those things happened because of sin. But God always ordained to work. He expects us to work. It is natural to work. It is good to work. And so we want to be working. And it's not always working for money. It could be something else, cleaning your garage, something else that you like to do. Maybe you're an organizer, or maybe you, you like to do this, or you like to do that, or you like to do this, or you like to read, or whatever I mean. Those, 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 those are things that be careful of idle time. It will, it, it will make a big hole in your breastplate. So the breastplate, is it imputed righteousness? Well, it is in a sense. Because without the imputed righteousness of Christ, we can't even have the right type of righteousness because we can't be changed, because we don't have the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that changes us into the image of Christ. So yes, in one sense, we have to have imputed righteousness, being born again. But really, it is us in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, yielding to Him by obeying principles, so that we don't have idle time, and that every day we work on our character. You know the areas of your character that are weak. Maybe you're a procrastinator. I have a tendency to be a procrastinator. I have a tendency sometimes to, you know, don't get it done, don't get it done. Then all of a sudden it's Friday and it needs to be done. And then I'm running around trying, trying to get it done. My daughter, I see it in my daughter, uh, Jackie, a major procrastinator. I mean, and, and where would she get that from? Probably from watching me. And, uh, and so, so find out those areas that you have a tendency to be weak in, in character, and embolden them. Ask God to give you victory over procrastination, victory over laziness, victory over slothfulness, victory over anger, victory over envy. All those areas of character that are maybe lacking in your life, help, ask God to help you in those areas. Find principles in the Bible uh, to help you and memorize them. And then what happens is that when that Satan and all his foes stand up in the morning and they launch an arrow by venture, because they don't know, they're not omnipresent, they, they don't know everything, and they launch all these arrows across the United States, when they come into Hampshire or wherever you live, you don't even see them. Because you are so focused on the cross that they just distinguish, or, or not distinguish, but um, disintegrate before they reach you. That's the breastplate of righteousness, and it's held by the belt of truth. So truth and righteousness, they go together. So we don't actually have a breastplate on, you realize that. But how do we put the breastplate on? By working on our character, working on our character. So work on your character. Work on it. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a lifetime of work. It's a lifetime of work. And sometimes we let that character down a little bit. Sometimes we just get in idle time. And our five-day story this year at Neighborhood Bible Time is about three boys that had too much idle time and they got in a lot of trouble. And so idle time is certainly on my mind from that story. Father, thank you as we are human and uh, we don't always... Uh, work on our character. 
we work on other things, but sometimes we allow our breastplate of righteousness, our protection, to have holes in it. The hard deck gets broken up. There's, there's, there's problems with it. And so help us to protect our soul, protect our conscience. We don't want it to be seared or peeled away or injured or damaged by, by anything. And so, Lord, help us to work on our character. Help us to be all we can be because you said we can be. And we're thankful for the provision that we have in you. So bless and encourage us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. At this time, we're going to uh, take some time for prayer. And then we have macadamia cookies. And we have um, cranberry. And we have chocolate chip cookies. And I saw a couple of the teens already eating the cookies. So um, that's a character problem. But then again, I bought a little bag for the car ride home when I bought the cookies. So I ate like three chocolate chip cookies before I even got here. Now, what would you call that? I say that's character. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, live stream, for being part of this. And we're going to go ahead and pray together and then we're going to go eat our cookies. Alrighty.